My name is Michael, and I am a writing, reading, speech coach in the Learning Commons of the College of DePage. This is part four of the Legal Writing web series, where I focus on correspondence. A little bit of background about me. I am an inactive California attorney. This means that I took the bar and I did practice in California, but I currently do not live in California, so I currently don't practice there. However, all of my information is useful in any jurisdiction because it's very general. Um, when I did practice, I was in civil litigation and workers' compensation litigation. I wrote all the time, whether it was letters, motions, responses, discovery, internal documents, um, pretty much anything that an attorney does, I was able to do. So I've talked about three main types of legal writing. We've covered already case briefs and motions. This last section is about correspondence. Correspondence is going to be the thing that you do most often because it includes every email you write and every letter you write. You have to keep in mind your audience. That's really the key. And your secret member to the audience is always the judge. You never know when any judge is going to come across your letter because of various reasons. Maybe it's a, a, a motion for sanctions against you. Maybe your client eventually sues you for malpractice and wants to use your letter as an exhibit. Always keep in mind the judge. We've previously looked at this slide in the motion um, seminar because it, it gives a basic three-part outline. I've already kind of discussed that, but if you skip that one, basically the three-part outline is your introduction, your body or your argument, and your conclusion. Pleadings and letters, even though they don't look anything alike, they do share that similar structure. So that introduction is, I tell you what I'm going to tell you. Your body or argument is, I tell you. And your conclusion is, I'm telling you what I already told you. You might need other parts uh, to complete the structure of the document, um, like you might need to drop some case law uh, in a correspondence. Um, you might need to have a little bit more information for your client, but this is a very general format. Uh, formatting the, the actual appearance of your words on the page is where there's the key difference between um, a motion and correspondence. Your motion is going to be written on pleading paper, whereas correspondence is just going to be written on letterhead. Please keep in mind, I'm going to repeat this throughout this what webinar, please keep in mind the audience. Not only does this dictate your word choice, keep in mind that the letters, as I've said twice before now, can end up in the hands of a judge as an exhibit. You have three main audiences when sending a legal letter, your client, the opposing counsel, or a judge. Always write thinking that this particular correspondence could end up before a judge. Always. Even if you write at the beginning of every client letter, which you, depending on your jurisdiction, you might need to at the very top write attorney-client privilege communication. That's sort of a warning that if for some reason something accidentally gets sent, um, that's a warning to whoever might be reading it that they really shouldn't be reading it. So the next thing I want to talk about is to know your purpose. Letters to your client are almost always going to be CYA letters. You want to make sure that you explain everything. Make sure that they are aware of upcoming hearings and other court dates, important deposition dates. Some jurisdictions allow um, the party, so the plaintiff, could attend the defendant's deposition and vice versa. Some jurisdictions do not allow that, but at least keep your client informed of what's going on in the case and what's happening. You want to explain the worst case scenario. What is the worst possible thing? This is the least, my least favorite part of being an attorney, is explaining what is the worst possible thing that could happen to your client in, her, in his or her case. And you want to make sure that they are aware of that. When that client then sues for malpractice, your CYA letter is going to generally be your saving grace and hopefully you've created a nice paper trail showing advice and recommendations and possible outcomes and it's not just really dependent on one letter you have this nice trail throughout the course of the case if that's if that's what's going on if that's how you're communicating with your client you almost certainly will win any 
potential malpractice case. Letters to opposing counsel are generally going to establish a paper trail for future motion practice. For example, if um, you find that their discovery re responses are insufficient, you, you're, you're looking for more information and they've, they've hidden behind some boilerplate objections, you can write a letter to your opposing counsel and, and ask them to actually still respond uh, despite those objections. Um, and they generally you can work together and, and work out something. In both cases, always think that a judge will eventually read this letter. So maybe you should not fire off a snappy and snarky comeback email um, because it will almost certainly be taken the wrong way and be used against you. Continuing to talk about purpose, what are you doing? Are you informing your client? Are you asking something of the opposing counsel? Are you asking something a second time? If you have given a threat such as, I will file a motion to compel if you don't respond within 15 days. Um, you want to make sure that you're going to file that motion by when you say you will. Um, because otherwise, your threats have no meaning and they have no teeth. And if they have no teeth, then, then why did you even say that you were going to file a motion in the first place? Also, keep in mind that emails are correspondence too, and as such, they could be used as an exhibit to a motion, both for your point and against you. Because there's no such thing as a sarcastic font, your words will be taken at face value. It's very much like uh, those of you that have taken contracts. Uh, any contract clause are going to be construed against the drafter. This applies to email and correspondence in general as well. Anything you write will be t uh, interpreted the worst possible way against you. At least that's the mindset you should have. So your correspondence introduction is, is really important. It's probably the most important letter of any correspondence uh, because it's going to have those instructions. It's going to have your purpose. What is it that you're doing with this letter? You're updating a client about an upcoming hearing. You're telling the opposing counsel that they need to, um, to provide further answers for their discovery. So the introduction should be literal, it should be exact, and it should be clear. By the time the person is done reading the introduction, they should not have any questions about what you are writing and why you are writing them. There's a clarity of thought they should be able to read your mind based on that first paragraph. This is not the time to use pretty flowery language. In fact, in legal writing, you almost never will do that, but certainly not in your correspondence. If you are requesting something, make that request. If you're asking your client to please respond to discovery, do it. If you uh, make that make that make it clear to your client. If you are want some certain information that you feel you are entitled to based on your discovery request, uh, make that clear to the opposing counsel. The reader should not have any questions about what you want after reading the first paragraph. So a good sample intro would be something like, my name is John Smith and I represent Paul Plaintiff in the above captioned matter. This letter is to inform you that the responses to interrogatories are overdue. That's pretty much all it needs to say. You know who I am. You know who I'm re representing. You know what case we're talking about. And you know what I'm telling you why I'm writing this letter. That's all clear and it's only two sentences. All right, so the next thing I want to discuss is the body of your correspondence. And this is where you're going to explain your request in detail. You're going to be direct and use case law if necessary. So the body is the heart of the letter. It's going to be dense, but you must be clear and to the point. It should be clear in its purpose. If your letter to, is to opposing counsel and it's about discovery issues, identify which you feel are the deficient responses and state why they are deficient. Be clear what you're doing, okay? You can potentially group a series of deficient responses. For example, California is, is, has what they call form interrogatories, and uh, there's, there's a series of, of just basically check boxes. In, it's, it's questions that are approved by the Supreme Court. Uh, 
and there's certain ways you have to respond to them. If they don't respond a certain way, then you can absolutely write this letter and tell them you didn't respond properly. Um, maybe your letter is about settlement discussions. If your letter is to opposing counsel about settlement, make sure you protect your communications. In California, you have to write pursuant to evidence code section 1152, the following communication is protected. And then you can continue on with your settlement discussion. Essentially, what this is designed to do is to prevent those settlement discussions from coming up in discovery, from coming up in trial. Uh, oh, isn't it true that you tried to settle this case um, two months ago? Uh, you, these, these questions are inappropriate in California trial, and this um, evidence code section protects um, settlement communications. The idea is um, cases should settle, um, we shouldn't have to go to trial. We should be able to resolve our differences uh, without going to trial. And that, that evidence code protects settlement communications. Okay, maybe your, your letter is bad news for your client. If your letter to your client is regarding bad news, be sure to explain the worst case scenario. You can use qualitative language to discuss alternatives, but you should absolutely give the worst possible outcome. For example, if the opposing counsel is successful in this motion, your case would be dismissed immediately. Now, that's a very strong terminal reaction. It's a terminal sanction, and there's, there has to be a really good reason for that to happen, but it is possible. Whatever you are trying to say, make sure you are very clear to your, to your audience, to your reader. So when you head to, the, head to the conclusion of your letter, you want to make sure you are restating your request or main point. Make it as clear as crystal that if you have late discovery or if, if opposing counsel has late discovery that you want that and when you want it. You want it within one week. Um, make it clear that the, your client needs to turn over all documents relating to this trust, any, any letter that they wrote, any 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 picture that they have you want to make sure that you get everything because you don't ever want to walk into a deposition and be surprised you don't want to walk into uh, a trap and 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 be caught off guard be caught flat-footed if you're going to give a deadline for your response make sure that you state the consequences for failing to respond and make it clear what you will do um, once if that is if your letter is not acted upon and make sure you follow through with those actions if you say i'm going to write a motion to compel if i don't hear from you within two weeks then you make sure in two weeks you have filed that motion to compel if you are going to drop your client because they are uh, um, they are failing to communicate with you make sure you go through the the, the proper process to withdraw from the case Keep in mind, litigation is a game and that there's another side. You won't always get what you want because the opposing counsel will almost certainly disagree with anything and everything that you have to say. They will call your argument a red herring and they will say that any motion to compel that you write is a waste of, of his or her money to respond to. It's a waste of his or her client's money to, re, to have to pay the attorney to respond to. It's a waste of the court's time because it's an irrelevant issue. Mostly, though, as long as you've done your research, this is just puffery. Um, also keep in mind, as it relates to your client, your client's not going to read your CYA letter, and then they're going to complain when one of those bad situations occur. This is the end of the correspondence uh, section of the legal writing webinar. Uh, thank you for paying attention. And if you have any questions regarding what you heard here, please feel free to make an appointment uh, in the uh, RASA. The information is on screen.